We come together this morning to mark Lord Kitchen's forthcoming retirement from the Supreme Court at the end of September. To celebrate his achievements as a lawyer and a judge, and to thank him for the immense contribution uh, that he has made to the law and to this court. It's a great pleasure to welcome members of the Kitchen family and their friends, and particularly Lady Kitchen, uh, their daughter Lara, and uh, son James. It's also a pleasure to welcome the Minister of State at the Ministry of Justice, uh, Edward Arger, to welcome back the former Lord Chancellor, Sir Robert Buckland, to welcome several professors uh, led by Professor Sir Roy Good uh, from the Centre for Commercial Law at Queen Mary University of London, where David serves as chair of the Advisory Council, to welcome several scientists from the Science Museum, where David serves on the advisory board, led by the chair of the Board of Trustees, Dame Mary Archer, and to welcome so many of Lord Kitchen's former colleagues at the bar and on the bench, led by the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls, and academics and practitioners from the world of intellectual property law and elsewhere. I'm sure that David would also like me to welcome particularly his former secretary, Isabel Brotherton Ratcliffe, and his former judicial assistants, Alia Al Yassin, Ramya Veer Bathran, Harry Taylor, and Ruth Keating. I also welcome all those who are joining us online. My predecessor but one, Lord Newberger, whom I also welcome here this morning, once remarked that a valedictory is like attending one's own funeral. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's such a bad thing. <laughs> Not many people have the privilege of being present during their own eulogy. <laughs> um, but this is an occasion when the maxim de mortuis nun is bonum is quite unnecessary. Nobody has a bad word for David Kitchen, even behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> David is unusual for a justice of this court, although not unique, in having studied science at university, switching to law in his final year, an ideal combination for his later career. He's also unusual, indeed unique among the justices, in having coxed the winning boat in the university boat race. The only drawback from the perspective of some of us is that he did so as a member of the light blue crew. <laughs> After university, David went to the bar, joining the chambers of his pupil master, Robin Jacob, now Professor Sir Robin Jacob, whom I'm also delighted to see here this morning. I also welcome many members of David's chambers at 8 New Square, and David's former clerk, John Call. Sir Robin was and is a specialist in intellectual property law, and David followed him into that field. David's practice began in the world of trademarks, confidential information, and passing off cases, and then extended into patents, where his scientific background came in useful. This is an area of the law of the greatest economic importance, and it calls for a very high level of ability uh, perhaps especially on the part of barristers, who have not only to understand the science and the law themselves, but also, what may be more difficult, explain them to judges in a way which makes sense to the non-scientists and non-IP specialists among them. David found himself in the House of Lords quite early on when he acted for British Steel against Granada Television seeking an order requiring television journalists to disclose the identity of the source 
who had given them confidential information about British Steel's redundancy plans. The order that David had drafted was ultimately upheld. Another important case, which we've had to examine closely in a recent appeal, was one dating from David's time in Silk, when he acted for the publishers of the Harry Potter books and obtained an injunction against persons unknown who had stolen advanced copies of one of the books and were offering them for sale. Other notable cases involved acting for Penguin against the footballer Paul Gascoigne, for Pfizer in a case about Viagra, and for Dyson in its battle with Hoover. In 2005, David left the bar to become a judge in the Chancery Division. So he has now been a judge for 18 years, a substantial period of public service. In the High Court, David extended his range beyond intellectual property law and also beyond London, as he served as a Chancery Supervising Judge for the Midland, Wales, and Western Circuits. He also became the senior judge of the Patents Court and a member of the enlarged Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office. In 2011, David was promoted to the Court of Appeal when his former pupil master, by then Lord Justice Jacob, retired and an intellectual property specialist was needed to replace him. In the Court of Appeal, David was responsible for the supervision of intellectual property appeals, but was also exposed to a wider range of legal problems and even took part in a notable criminal appeal concerned with the admissibility of expert evidence based on a Bayesian analysis of footprints. But his judgments on intellectual property issues, such as FRAND, that's to say the global licensing of standard essential patents, second medical use claims, and transgenic mouse technology were especially important. In October 2018, David joined this court, the first intellectual property specialist to be appointed to it. But David has not worked as a specialist in this court by any means. We have only one or two intellectual property cases each year, and so David has had to sit on cases from all areas of the law, like the rest of us. Indeed, for some time, David was unable to sit on our intellectual property cases, as there are all appeals from his own decisions in the Court of Appeal. <laughs> We upheld him nearly always. <laughs> the one time we didn't, we received an Olympian rebuke in the Law Quarterly Review. <laughs> so, like other judges of this court, David has had to be, and has proved himself to be, extremely versatile, writing excellent judgments on a wide range of subjects. I would pick out three judgments as illustrating the range and importance of his contribution to our work. The first is the recent litigation between Russia and Ukraine, where David wrote the part of our judgment concerned with how the law of agency operates in the context of intergovernmental negotiations, conducted by a prime minister and cabinet operating within constitutional structures. This was completely uncharted territory and very much a case for the books. The second is a judgment in a Privy Council appeal from Bermuda, East Asia and PT Satria, which is now the leading authority on the tricky question of the apparent authority of company directors, where company law and the law of agency intersect. The third is a judgment on which Dave and, and others are currently working, concerned with the question whether injunctions can properly be granted against unnamed persons, and if so, the proper juridical basis for such orders and the safeguards to which they should be subject, a question which takes us back to David's case at the bar concerning the Harry Potter books. 
These are all matters of great practical importance. David has the great gift of writing about them as he's written about the most complex questions in intellectual property law mm -hmm. in a way which explains complicated matters clearly and persuasively. We are very pleased that on his retirement, David will be joining our supplementary panel and will continue to sit on the court from time to time. Nevertheless, we will miss him. He has been a wonderful and very popular colleague, always meticulously prepared, always open to considering other points of view, never seeking to browbeat, always good-humoured, and above all, always committed to doing what is right. We wish him and Charlotte well in the next phase of their lives. Mr. Purvis. Thanks, uh, my lady, and in particular, my Lord Lord Kitchen. Uh, it is truly an honor uh, to be asked to speak on behalf of the patent bar and the intellectual property profession more generally to mark our appreciation of your achievements on the bench uh, and in what is unfortunately got to be a short speech to attempt to review the great corpus of judgments uh, which will be your legacy uh, in our field. When you embarked on your illustrious career as a barrister from Francis Taylor Buildings in 1977, uh, it is fair to say that the tiny group of practitioners practicing at what was known as the patent bar were regarded as clever but slightly odd, uh, <laughs> plowing a, an obscure furrow on the edge of the field of legal respectability. <laughs> Specialist patent judges of great intellect had successfully been appointed from the bar to the High Court since 1949, George Lloyd Jacob, Patrick Graham, Jack Whitford. But there seems to have been no thought or expectation that they might ascend beyond this judicial rank. It is fair to say that things have changed a great deal since then. And the Patents Court uh, is no longer a strange appendage to the Chancery Division, hidden at the end of the basement corridor of the Royal Courts of Justice next to the caretaker's office, uh, where I first saw you in action uh, in Court 24. Intellectual property is now at the heart of the business and property courts, and judges who originally specialised in this field have made valuable contributions across the whole gamut of civil law. And much of this change can be put down to the extraordinary generation of barristers who emerged from three small sets of chambers in the late 1970s and 80s and became some of the outstanding chancery judges of our time. Uh, William Aldous, Hugh Laddie, Robin Jacob, and Nicholas Pumphrey uh, blazed the trail, but your Lordship's career has, of course, surpassed even their achievements and finally breached the citadel of elevation uh, to the highest court in the land. Uh, as we've heard, you joined the High Court bench in 2005, and reading back over your judgments of this vintage, your style is immediately recognizable. Total clarity of thought and expression, and just as important, the ability to take the reader through a logical journey after which the result seems all but inevitable. Uh, many of these first instance judgments are still regularly cited uh, at all levels. Uh, in the time, I can only give three examples. Julius Saman and Tetrasil, and the unpromising context of a case about those fir tree air fresheners <laughs> annoyingly suspended from the rear view mirror of taxis, uh, you gave a lucid exposition of the law of extended protection under the Trademarks Act and the thorny issue of due cause. Uh, in Arrow and Merck, you recognized the existence of an important and brand new cause of action, the Arrow Declaration, giving manufacturers the ability to obtain legal certainty uh, in the face of a potentially endless assertion of monopolies for the same invention under the divisional patent system. And in Generics and Lundbeck in 2007, uh, you coined a pithy summary of the factors relevant to the question of obviousness, which has now been cited so often, uh, including by the Supreme Court itself, that the next step will no doubt be to incorporate it into the Patents Act itself. <laughs> uh, 
Promoted to the Court of Appeal after only six years, uh, you produced a series of definitive statements of the law uh, on a variety of difficult subjects. I will highlight uh, only two. In 2013, a well-known supermarket took the unfortunate decision to promote its new opticians business under the slogan, be a real spec saver at Asda, uh, which for some reason caused a great deal of upset to a rival company. On the bright side, the case gave your lordship the opportunity to provide lucid guidance on many difficult issues, including confusing similarity unfair advantage and trademark use. In the area of patents, uh, I would highlight your judgment in IPCOM and Nokia, which is a magisterial account of the law of added subject matter, previously regarded with fear and loathing by practitioners, especially those asked by a wide-eyed pupil to explain it to them. Uh, now we can simply pass them a copy of the reports of patent cases from 2013. Job done. Uh, as we've heard, joining the Supreme Court in 2018 inevitably reduced your opportunities to illuminate the law of intellectual property. But nonetheless, you've made a major contribution on employee compensation for inventions in Shanks and Unilever. And we may, one would hope, expect further important insights in decisions yet to be published on bad faith in trademark applications in Skykick and the interesting area of inventions made by artificial intelligence in Thaler and the Comptroller General. Your judgments, if I may say so, represent the best of the common law tradition. The peculiar facts of any given case are treated as a source of illumination of established legal principles, not as a way of driving the development of those principles in any particular direction. Your statements of the law are broad-based, thorough, reliable, and capable of application to any set of facts. They will, I predict, stand the test of time and will continue to be referred to by many future generations of lawyers. Speaking personally, it was, of course, always a delight to be in your Lordship's court, despite losing more than my fair share of cases there. I have one complaint to make, however. As a barrister, one develops ways of dealing with defeat. And personally, I favour a general feeling of resentment. <laughs> but the judge clearly wasn't prepared to listen or had willfully misunderstood or misrepresented one's arguments. And there is a certain pleasure to be had in this, but even this small consolation was never available from your judgment. You were always prepared to listen. You never mischaracterized the arguments or treated them impolitely, and your reasoning was always transparently fair. Not all your decisions are as well known as they should be. And in the course of reviewing your early career, I found a number which deserve more attention. <laughs> Uh, and in particular, uh, one on appeal from the trademark registry when it fell to you to decide the delicate question of whether a trademark which I shall pronounce FOOK, F-O-O-K, <laughs> should not be admitted onto the register because it was contrary to accepted principles of morality. Your Lordship, despite the obvious challenges, handed down a judgment of profound seriousness. <laughs> First, you had to consider the authorities. Uh, in particular, you had to distinguish the liberal approach taken by the European registry in granting a trademark which one can only imagine had been formed from the first names of the founders of a business. Uh, one of them, a lady called Fanny, and the other one, who I assume was christened at birth, Richard. <laughs> Then you make the critical finding of fact that the mark Fook and the Anglo-Saxon term it was alleged to resemble would be pronounced in the same way in a number of regional dialects. <laughs> Tragically, no audio recording exists at the hearing. <laughs> but it would have been a joy to hear your lordship exploring with the applicant the different ways in which the two words were pronounced perhaps in Newcastle, Manchester, or Exeter. Uh, finally, I should refer to the last time I was in this court. 
in a case called Regeneron and Chimab, uh, the very case about patents for transgenic mice to which my Lord has already referred. Uh, these mice were in the business of producing human antibodies for the purpose of research. It was an appeal, in fact, from a judgment of your lordship in the Court of Appeal, and it was held by this court that you had made a rare error of law, and as a result, wrongly ordered the destruction of hundreds of mice which you had found to be infringing a patent. This might have been a tragic affair, the Supreme Court's pardon arriving too late to save the innocent victims of a terrible miscarriage of justice. <laughs> However, it turned out that even as you refused permission to appeal, you had nonetheless granted a stay of execution, <laughs> both of the order and of the mice, uh, pending an application to this court. And if I may say so, this demonstrated uh, two admirable aspects of your Lordship's character, humility and a sensitivity to the rights of vulnerable creatures. As a result of your concern, uh, the mice were able to be saved and to live out their lives in a luxury rest home for partially human rodents. <laughs> <laughs> on their behalf, and my own, and on behalf of the intellectual property profession generally, uh, may I wish your Lordship a similarly happy, though I am sure much longer and more fulfilling, period of retirement. Mr. Alexander. My Lord, my Lady, my Lord. Mr. Purvis has focused on your contribution to intellectual property law. May I mention a few wider points illustrative of your approach and then return closer to home. Um, Lord Reed referred to Lord Debenture in Ukraine. That, that in case involved a temptation, given international events, to develop the law of capacity, authority, and indeed legitimacy of countermeasures to provide the state of Ukraine with an additional potential defense. As uh, Lord Bingham, who presides over all of us here, uh, might have uh, said, tempting but wrong. You did not give in to that temptation. Uh, the commercial duress defense was arguable, and that was enough. To do more would have risked undermining important aspects of commercial law in state finance. It was a juridical manifestation, if I may say so, of an approach favored by the world's most famous patent adjudicator. And on this occasion, I do not mean Sir Robin Jacob, <laughs> but Einstein, whose first job was as a patent examiner and whose view was that things should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. The kitchen approach. Mm -hmm. The second case that merits mention is uh, one uh, from the Privy Council uh, this year. Uh, it involved egregious police and judicial failures, resulting in a young man languishing in prison for years from a wrongly admitted confession. Uh, as are all uh, of this court knows, some modesty is required with Caribbean uh, appeals, since they can raise questions of, uh, if I may put it delicately, judicial legitimacy. Uh, you used measured terms in the judgment you uh, uh, delivered with uh, my Lord, Lord Burroughs. But you pulled no punches. You corrected an injustice unaddressed by that country's judiciary. But your manner of expression increased the power, legitimacy, and unanswerability of the message. As the President has, uh, the President has indicated, your background has equipped you to recognize that this court, which stands among global leaders in the rule of law, must, in an increasing number of cases, seek justification and legitimacy from scientific as much as from legal reason. Laws of nature provide no more room than the laws of war to stand on, if I may put it like this, Lord Simon's side of modern libisage debates. You have been well equipped to bring that perspective, which is important in all spheres where governance requires full account to be taken of the science. Which brings me to your Lordship's other personal qualities. You are, if I may say so, an embodiment of anxious scrutiny. You are noted <laughs> for meticulous preparation and calm. Indeed, I've only seen that ruffled on one occasion. 
It was a case in which you led me, where our clients were being sued on a patent which required a laundry tablet to be put into a mesh bag. That was alleged to be obvious in the light of a historical practice in Spain of people doing their laundry by putting soap into stockings and throwing them into the washing machine. On the other side, I think they're here today, <laughs> or saw that requiring our witnesses to discuss washing their linen in public would not produce a happy outcome, and ultimately none of them came. However, the patentee did call an expert to say that the patent was inventive. Now, your lordship, as your lordship always does, have prepared hours of detailed questions uh, for him. <laughs> you were totally fired up. <laughs> a couple of minutes into his cross-examination, you asked him some preliminary question like, so, Mr. X, you, you think that the patent was inventive? And the terrified witness, of course, immediately responded, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> you turned to me with a panicked look. <laughs> what on earth do I do now? <laughs> so while others are left at a loss as to what to do next by their failures, your lordship is only left flawed by unexpected success. <laughs> but shortly after that, of course, the other side threw in the towel, together with their stockings. <laughs> you recognize, however, that success in law and on the bench needs help. When your lordship was appointed as a judge, you were taken, I think, a bit by surprise. You had to make a rapid decision as to whether to accept a role which is sometimes lonely and exposed. Uh, it is a job that cannot be done, or at least not happily done, without the full support of surrounding families, whether personal or professional. And Charlotte, Lady Kitchen, arranged a, a touching dinner to, I think, boost your early morale. Not that it uh, very often needs boosting. And she has been a constant support throughout your career. We are grateful to her and to your family as well for their service indirectly to uh, the law and this country. Which brings me back to your question. What on earth do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, you took the advice of that most learned of hands in our domain, Sir Robin, to take a three-month honeymoon on the basis that you would never be able to take a break like it again, so successful would you be. He was, of course, right, and your career as an advocate and judge has been, in your words, full on. You may welcome some time to reflect. But we know that your lordship is not one to push yourself to the fore. At a patent judges conference not long ago, you were called upon to talk about AI, uh, on which your lordship may have much to say shortly in a case currently before this court. Entirely appropriately, you gave nothing whatever away. Your lordship may have greater freedom to express yourself in retirement. One former member of this court exercises his droit de senior, if I may use medieval franglais, <laughs> to offer views on many topics, <laughs> even quite recently, in a peer-owned, if not perhaps peer-reviewed journal, known for an illustrated, if perhaps not illustrious, case commentary on a certain issue of constitutional law, which your lordship also had to consider a while ago. Your lordship may not put your lordship's oars in as widely. As a former victorious cox, you know that it is not only those who are most obviously active whose influence is critical. You coxed the rerun of the famous boat race in Paris, as the boats approached a sane bridge with its narrow arches, risky collision, Oxford rowed on. You told your crew to ship oars, and your crew cruised to victory yet again. On water and on bench, small interventions leading to things done and sometimes not done can have an impact as decisive as anything more splashy. You will doubtless continue to make valuable contributions. You have a new honorary position at UCL, and we hope that you will share your knowledge, experience, and wisdom with a rising generation. Others from this court have found satisfaction in ADR, for which your lordship would be very well suited. It was, of course, too much to hope that we could have just one gathering of those concerned with IP, which did not mention FRAND. <laughs> that acronym to which the president has referred ex uh, expresses a core theme you have often dealt with how the fruits of creativity 
now often collective and international, should be recognized and shared in fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory ways. And increasingly how, and by reference to what principles and where, those matters should be decided. Those are very modern questions uh, for this court and for this country. One aspect of this was reflected in the first patent case you sat on in this court, to which Mr. Purvis has referred. It concerned how benefits from a valuable patent should be shared between employer and employee. My side had succeeded at three separate instances uh, until the case came to this court. I am bound to say that the questions your lordship and Lady Black asked were rather too incisive and thoughtful for my liking. <laughs> and they brought a disturbingly fresh, indeed unanswerable, perspective to bear. As the last Prime Minister, but one might have said, where is the respect for multifactorial evaluation by the primary decision maker when you need it most? <laughs> But win or lose, this country would not and should not want it or have it any other way. Good governance in all its aspects relies on the incisive, thoughtful, dispassionate analysis which you have brought over a long judicial career and which contributes to the respect with which this court is held around the world. And as Mr. Purvis has indicated, losing to your lordship's judgment is as sweet a sorrow as this field affords. And so to parting. Other justices of this court, including Lady Black, have stepped down at a similar stage, which is, we must remind ourselves, well after the normal retirement age for judges in many countries. Your ability, youth, and energy mean that what is normal in many contexts still seems premature in your case. Put simply, we like having you here. You may be retiring, but fortunately you're not shy, so we're glad to hear that your voice will also continue to be heard on the supplementary panel. You sit today among a flotilla's worth of family, friends, colleagues, and admirers here and online. Your former chambers are especially proud of your presence in this court, reflecting your abilities as well as the increased importance of IP and science in law. Your families of supporters, personal and professional, here and around the world, celebrate your outstanding career as advocate and judge. We thank you for your service to the law in this court and others before. And finally, our area always has its eyes and its imagination on the future. On behalf of the many who have loved working with you and who have benefited from your guidance, support, wisdom, and positive spirit, we wish you and your family the best for yours. Lord Kitchen. Thank you, Robert, Daniel, Ian, for your generous words and your friendship. I'm also extremely grateful to all of my colleagues in this court and indeed to all of you for coming here today. So many of you have played an important part in my personal and professional life. It has been an extraordinary privilege to serve as a justice of this court for the last five years. It's also been, as you've heard, the culmination of a judicial career of about 18 years and the most recent chapter in a professional life which began over 40 years ago. I've been fortunate in many ways since those early days, but my greatest good fortune has been to find Charlotte, my darling wife, partner, with whom I've shared most of that professional journey. Life as a judge or barrister is demanding, and any success I may have enjoyed is due as much to Charlotte as to anyone else, and the love and support she has given me unfailingly and at whatever personal cost. We have two wonderful and kind children, Lara and James, and they too are here today. Their ability, common sense, humor, positivity have been invaluable, as is their ability to deal with much that life has thrown at them, including a father absent for too much of the time. You've had to put up with a lot I owe you all more than I can say. One theme in my life, in and alongside the law, has been my passion for science and the natural world. I think that flourished in my childhood in rural Northamptonshire, where my father was a mining engineer and my mother a teacher. It was a blissful time, and our adventures were in the woods and farms that lay around our home. 
Our village school seemed comfortably to house all the local children in a single classroom, in rows reflecting their age. Some might say a metaphor for court one on occasions. <laughs> all this led in time to a degree in science and law under the Tripos system, and then a place to chambers in IP law. Now that may seem, as you've heard, a rather mysterious subject, full of imaginary people, such as the ordinary skilled person and the average consumer. Some say we set about abusing the English language with terms like uh, pharmaceutically acceptable and rotatably connected. In the 1970s, IP has, as you've heard, also acquired a reputation for long and expensive trials. How things changed in the years just before and after my arrival. Changes driven by a number of energetic and creative thinkers, including my pupil master, Robin Jacob, of whom much has been said this morning, then the Treasury junior, and Hugh Laddie, whose widow, Stisha, is here also today. I'm so pleased to have played a part, however modest, in that evolution. But these changes were necessary. Rapid developments were afoot in the life sciences, in medicine, telecommunications, computing, branding, and in all kinds of industrial and other designs. The digital world was expanding and generating new markets for consumers and businesses. The supply of spare parts and repair services offered further opportunities. All of these technologies and activities required investment, and investment needs fair protection for the new products and services it, it funds. This meant innovative approaches to enforcement and new remedies in this country and abroad, because piracy has never shown much respect for national boundaries. It also emphasized the need for checks and balances, respect for freedom of speech, for the privilege against self-incrimination, the right to be heard, the right to repair, the obligation to license inventions incorporated into national standards. Here, I have many people to thank. Of course, Robin for taking me on, my colleagues in chambers, my practice manager, John Call. Many became friends for life, and the pupils, and after taking silk, the junior barristers who had to put up with me as their leader, and some of whom are themselves now judges. But I must also thank my clients, often household names who became uh, and trusted me to represent them and their solicitors, many of whom have become lifelong friends and are here today, and for whom no request seemed too much trouble. Well, it seemed like quite a lot of trouble, but they did it anyway. <laughs> and perhaps above all to the judges who took these changes in their stride, or at least generally so. Uh, there was one judge to whom I made an application who responded, well, I'm all for innovation, Mr. Kitchen, but this has never been done before. <laughs> <laughs> now to a second uh, theme. I've always tried to promote the public understanding of science and the law, and I've been fortunate to sit on the advisory board of the Science Museum, a truly national treasure. And I'm so pleased to see so many leading figures from that institution and the world of science here today, including Dame Mary Archer, Professor O'Cheng, Professor Foster, and Sally Shuttleworth. All wonderful uh, and uh, outstanding scientists and the exhibitions and seminars they provide are unfailingly interesting, relevant, and accessible. I am very fortunate, too, to have been involved for many years with Queen Mary, and more recently, the Center for Commercial Law Studies, another extraordinary institution founded and led by the brilliant, evergreen, and unfailingly enthusiastic Roy Good. And it's wonderful to see him here today, and so many other teachers and former judges who are now involved in teaching in that school. But I want to return next to the theme with which I began, my public services as a High Court judge, in the Court of Appeal, and most recently in this court. At every stage, I have had exceptional support from counsel appearing before us, our court staff, sometimes beyond the call of duty, my clerks in the High Court, the Court of Appeal, uh, the wonderful Don Bennett, who joined me on, the appointment, on my appointment as the supervising judge for the Midlands, Wales, and the West Country, and from the JAs, who've assisted me here in the Supreme Court, one each year, but all here today, and each extraordinarily able, full of life, humor, mischief, and at times a healthy disrespect for authority. <laughs> our chief executives, Mark and now Vicky, our registrars, librarians, our IT staff, the comms team, our PAs, Isabel, who could anticipate my needs before I knew them myself, Daniel, Maya, our maintenance staff and our security and all the other unsung heroes who keep us operating. I thank you all. 
Ultimately, I've seen my role as a justice to try and uphold the rule of law, to decide the points of law of general public importance upon which the appeals turn, sometimes in cases of great constitutional and public importance, and to try and explain our decisions in clear and readily comprehensible language. It requires a good deal of hard work and cooperation. It also requires extraordinary, if not superhuman, powers of our presidents and vice presidents, most recently Lord Reed and uh, Lord Hodge, and before them, Lady Hale, Lord Newberger. Powers they seem to find in near limitless quantities. I admire them and I am grateful to them all. I found a spirit of collegiality promotes this work, even if there is, at the end of the day, disagreement uh, between us. But that is to be expected in, in a court uh, with persons such as presently uh, are around me, with strong and independent-minded colleagues. Uh, and of course, it is too uh, the nature of the appeals that we hear. None of that is or may not be apparent for, from the finished product. I've also enjoyed all the outreach work we do, the moots, the talks, the questions of our many visiting students, meeting visitors from the UK and abroad, liaising and discussing topical legal issues with judges here and in other jurisdictions. Serious challenges lie ahead. Among them, the benefits and risks of AI, climate change, the impact of the online world and social media, all, which will, all of them will impact on our day-to-day -day lives. And of course, the modernization of our procedures and processes. Much has been said about them in other contexts, and I support all the efforts being made to address them. But now, for me, it is time to step back from full-time judging and to reflect, to spend more time with Charlotte, to admire and learn more about the wonderful world in which we live, and so far as time and circumstances allow, to continue to assist in all these endeavors where I can. Thank you. Now, I know that some of you uh, will now have to rush back to the Royal Courts of Justice or elsewhere. But those of you who are able to stay a little longer, I hope you will join us for tea or coffee in the lobby behind you. And we will see you there in just a moment or two. The court will adjourn. Thank you.